Morning, uh, welcome at uh, the Italian Cultural Institute. Uh, the official uh, leader of uh, this evening will be Silvia Carlogosi, uh, PhD at uh, UPenn. I remember her very, very well uh, with uh, a wonderful dissertation uh, that I think was also uh, the inspiration for his uh, for her first book. Uh, um, a Grammar of Cinepoiesis, Poetic Cameras in Italian Cinema, 2015. She is Assistant Professor of Italian uh, at Bronx Community College of CUNY, and uh, she published uh, various articles on Italian literature and cinema. So thank you very much, Silvia, for uh, proposing, suggesting uh, this uh, uh, evening, the topic of this evening. I will uh, leave you the floor. It's okay. <laughs> so, yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. So, I'm uh, Riccardo Lattanzi, the president of MIA, Marchigiana in America, which is an association for the promotion of the culture and tradition of the Marche region in Italy. And, uh, yeah, I just want to say is I'm very glad to be back in person because it's the first event in person since February 2020 when we did a party for a carnival. And, and uh, we were supposed actually to celebrate Maria Montessori in 2020 because that's the 150th anniversary of her birthday, of her birth. But uh, yeah, we couldn't do it, but I'm glad we were able uh, uh, tonight to do it. And I think the book was not published in 2020, so we couldn't have done it. And uh, so I know all of you here, I know the association, but for if there are people who are connected or may watch the video after, we have a web. Uh, website but mostly a Facebook page where we continuously post material about Mark like stories of Marchigiani in, uh, in the United States and uh, we have also now an ongoing uh, photographic contest online which have four teams we did the winter now it's the spring then going to be the summer uh, uh, and the autumn and then we're probably going to do a book at the end uh, because the pictures the photographs are amazing and uh, so now I will leave the floor to Silvia, which is a board member of the association. And, she, and I thank her for uh, organizing this event. And I thank the speaker and mostly the director, uh, Fabio Finotti, for uh, hosting us. Thank you. So um, let's start with thanking Istituto Italiano di Cultura and Professor Fabio Finotti, who welcomed our um, invitation or our proposal for this presentation with open hearts. So thank you so much. We are really glad to be here in person. And I'm really happy to introduce to you Erika Moretti, uh, who's a colleague and a friend, and um, her book is definitely closer the microphone. Is this better? OK. And if you don't, it, it was just a little bit too far. That's better? OK. So Erika Moretti is also an assistant professor of Italian at the Fashion Institute of Technology of New York here, SUNY. Her research is uh, rooted in biopolitics, gender and sexuality studies, and critical theory. She focuses on pacifism, refugees, and displacement, and humanitarianism in modern Italy. She has also published various articles in many academic journals and also in various magazines and newspaper, including the Washington Post and the Manifesto. Today we're talking about her first book, uh, titled the Maria Montessori, The Best Weapon for Peace, Maria Montessori, Education and Children's Rights, who was which was published only uh, last year, a few months ago. So again, we are really happy to have her here, and we are really happy to celebrate the life and the work of Maria Montessori. I'll say a couple of words about Maria Montessori of what the general public knows, and then I'll open the floor to Erica. But what do we know, what the general public knows about Maria Montessori is that she's a worldwide renowned figure, a very strong female figure, pioneer in education. She's known for bringing um, classrooms experiences at the children's level. Uh, her groundbreaking contribution for educational learning is based on promoting independence for kids, for children, 
um, that follow a personal education path that the children uh, choose for themselves uh, following their physical, psychological, social, and academic uh, development. Uh, Montessori schools are everywhere. Uh, every country in the world has some Montessori schools. In New York and in the US are probably the most concentration of Montessori schools. But there is so much more about uh, Maria Montessori. And Erika Moretti's book, book brings to the surface an aspect of Montessori that very few know. Maria Montessori's ideas and vision expand beyond the classroom as an education for life and especially the, um, in the link between education and peace. She started her work with children that were coming from poor families and they were affected from World War I. So how important is today to focus on Maria Montessori's main ideas, principal ideas, I want to say. Uh, be, um, yeah, because it's a moment, like we all know, we just have to open the TV to see what is happening nowadays in these very moments with children, with civil, with, with war uh, breaking up again. So talking about pacifism and for talking about peace right now, I think is very important. And knowing that someone like Montessori started uh, to give these ideas 150 or about years ago is even more important. So let's start uh, talking about your main thesis um, in this book, right? Which is that Maria Montessori she is definitely an educator, she's definitely a pedagogue, but mostly and foremost, a pacifist. So what do you mean by this? And what is the difference in all these terms? Yeah. We're talking about various big terms. Please try to help us. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. And uh, thank you, Professor Pinotti, for inviting us. So it's a pleasure to be talking about my book. Uh, I mean, Montessori, the way I explained it is that Montessori was as much as a pacifist, but she was an educator. And of course, that has to do more with the way, you know, sort of academic publishers want us to have a strong thesis when we write a book. But it's also a way of thinking about Montessori from a different perspective. Uh, Montessori's pedagogy informed her vision of pacifism. But I was working, as, a, as I was reading Montessori's work and as I was uh, uh, sort of uh, thinking about in what way Montessori was right, was thinking about education and peace, I realized that this was not a sort of a parenthesis, a momentary engagement on the side of the educator, but there was something that instead uh, involved Maria Montessori throughout her life. Uh, Silvia, if we can show, uh, thank you so much, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, if you're thinking about Maria Montessori's pacifism, uh, you're thinking about a set of writings that Montessori publishes from the beginning of the 1930s to the end of uh, the 1940s. So here, um, one of the main source for information on Maria Montessori are the main Montessori organizations. Uh, Montessori has uh, a big one, it's called AMI, Association Montessori Internacional. It is based in Amsterdam because the Montessori, Montessori lived in Amsterdam for an extended period of time, and so, the, and so do her descendants. They lived in Amsterdam. So if you look into the website of the uh, main organization, you'll have a timeline of Maria Montessori's life and engagement with pacifism that looks at the 1930s, right? So you have as a sort of a, a, a first uh, sort of signpost, you have the Declaration of the Rights of the Children, not written by Maria Montessori, but just to give you an idea on when people and when educators and pedagogues started thinking about peace, uh, how peace could be achieved through education. Maria Montessori has a set of writings that are published from 1932 to the end of the 1940s that are collected in a, uh, in a book titled Education and Peace. What happens then, uh, it's that Montessori is nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1949, 1950, and 1951. And the organization puts together writings and says, this is Maria Montessori's engagement, it's a parenthesis. She cared about peace in the 1930s. And she cared about peace means that she worked to uh, utilize education as a means to achieve peace. What I do with my book instead is to say that Montessori was not interested in pacifism only in a short period of her life, 
but instead she worked to achieve peace in multiple ways throughout her life. So what I've done with my book, if you can move the slide, thank you so much, <laughs> is to recover uh, the smaller writings uh, and the different ways in which she engaged on peace and humanitarianism. And I'll explain you later what it means because she, uh, the goal of achieving a peaceful society is something that she worked toward throughout her entire life. So as you can see, fresh out of La Sapienza, Montessori attends, uh, uh, she becomes a fem she is a feminist. She's engaged with feminist movement until I would say 1908. In, in 1896, at the climax of the Italian colonial enterprise, Montessori publishes an op-ed in which she declares the fact that she opposed the, wars in, the war in Africa. So this is one of the first uh, sort of public efforts that Montessori accomplishes to speak in, in which she speaks about pacifism. It is necessary to actually free the colonial subjects that have recently been subjugated by the Italian government. And she speaks specifically about women at the time. But then you have also Montessori's work with the Messina Reggio earthquake children in 1910. She works to recuperate what she calls uh, the mental facu faculties that have been impacted by the trauma of the earthquake. And this is 1910. 19, uh, in 1916, she works with the children uh, affected by the Great War, and so on and so forth. So what I've done with my work is to see the different ways in which Montessori was thinking of peace. Of course, Montessori was an educator and she was a pedagogue, so her engagement with peace always has to do with education and that she considered pedagogy and education as a tool, or Montessori would say as a weapon, she would say it herself, to achieve peace and a peaceful society. How would she do that? Well, I mean, she has direct intervention. She would say, you know, I'm a pacifist, I'm opposing the war in Africa, so that's uh, one way of intervening. Uh, she would also work to create uh, a couple of humanitarian organizations. None of those organizations would pan out. But she also thought that her methodology was the real tool to achieve peace. So if you've been in a Montessori classroom, uh, children care deeply about the environment. Caring about the environment means that children will develop a sort of a peaceful relationship with uh, the things and the people around them. So what happens in a Montessori classroom is that the child moves uh, with, a, with an inner harmony that will be reverberated onto the classroom, onto uh, the child's peers, and onto the family, and to expand on you know, society at large. So it's, a, it's an ambitious project that starts with the child and that really has sort of a, a, sort of a rippling e effect to include society as a whole. Amazing, no, <laughs> it's, it's like if everybody could really start as a child <laughs> and think about this, we would live in a different world. Um, you, told, uh, you talked about something else, about humanitarianism, or she was a humanitarian. What do you mean by that, or can you unpack this other big term for us. Absolutely. So um, I want to give you another example before we move on to humanitarianism. Yeah, we want, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's uh, in a second. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's easy. <laughs> so uh, Montessori talked about peace within the classroom um, and the uh, sort of like the pacifist intervention that she had when it came to pedagogy. It's deeply connected to what she would do as a humanitarianist in the sense that uh, the activities that she developed for children within the classroom were also at the core of her humanitarian projects. Um, if you can show us the next images, I think they would be, uh, they would, I'll be able to sort of transition from Montessori's pedagogy to her humanitarian work. So this is 1910, we're in Rome. Uh, Montessori takes on a new project that um, it's, a, it's a training course for Montessori teachers and the course is uh, held uh, in a convent uh, uh, in Piazza Vittorio, the convent is still there, uh, which is behind the Termini train station. Um, the convent is a convent of Franciscan nuns. Uh, the whole endeavor is sponsored by the Queen Margherita, who wants to help the children who have been affected by the Messina Reggio earthquake in 1908. Montessori was no stranger to uh, sort of like helping these children because she was uh, closely related to Leopoldo Franchetti, the senator, who was, at the, who, who was the head of the Associazione Nazionale per gli Interessi del Mezzogiorno, an organization that was in charge of taking care of the children affected by the earthquake. 
So what Montessori does here is that she takes on 60 children who have been orphaned by the earthquake and starts working on uh, uh, training the teachers with this special subset of children. So what she does here, it's 1910, she had recently published in Metodo. Um, you know, she's achieving national and international notoriety, more and more schools are opening up in Italy, Milan. She's working with really important organizations, with uh, Humanitaria in Milan, uh, her method is being translated in English. Um, so it's a, it's a big moment for her, but she's still developing, developing her pedagogy. She would soon publish the Montessori method for the, elementary, uh, for the elementary school year. So she has done three to six, now she's gonna be covering six to 12 as she's experimenting with these children. So what she does is that uh, she notices that these children are affected by what she called a special form of mental disturbance. This is 1910, PTSD, post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder, will only be discussed 60, 65 years later. And Montessori had nothing to, accept, to assess the actual, what she would later call mental wounds that affected these children. She, that's the term that Montessori would use. But she's interested in helping these children recover from what she calls the trauma of the earthquake. Now, um, Montessori was a graduate, she graduated in medicine. Uh, she wrote a thesis, uh, uh, she was a psychiatrist. And so she was invested in, uh, in the rehabilitation of these children. So how would you rehabilitate the children affected by the earthquake? Well, if you've been in a Montessori classroom in the three to six period, one of the key components are the so-called practical life activities. So what your child would do is set the table, wash the dishes, and if you're in Italy, you'll be lucky enough that the plates are gonna be in ceramic, the glasses are gonna be in glass. You know, that it doesn't really happen in the United States as much because of probably liability issues. But in Italy, in many Montessori schools, it's still like that kind of fragile, you know, sort of uh, materials that the children have to handle. And what you have here is a series of photos. Ah, oh, yeah, we already have some here a series of photos of the children affected by the earthquake. So the children are conducting so-called practical life activities. Again, you will see them now. She's probably setting a table, they're washing the dishes. The next photo, uh, what you will see is a, a young girl, age three to six, serving soup. Uh, you have uh, uh, other children just sitting at the table and enjoying their meal. Again, uh, uh, the photos are taken from the archive of the Franciscan, Com the Franciscan missionary of Larry. I think there is another More? couple of photos. Yes. <clears throat> I wanted to signal the transition here. This is a 1913 edition of Il Metodo. Uh, here, what Montessori is doing is uh, sort of promoting these practical life activities and how they're utilized on the international level. This is a school in San Francisco. Montessori has recently traveled to the United States. And uh, again, her methodology is uh, uh, sort of like spreading in the United States. Here you have, uh, I mean, what I fantasize is probably a young boy rolling pasta, but I, I don't really know. I mean, there's a rolling pin who know what he's doing. Uh, so, um, here on the lower right, children washing glasses, setting the table, waiting for lunch. So the idea of uh, sort of respecting the environment and taking care of the environment is foundational to the Montessori method in that children were supposed to be taking care of uh, people around them to serve them and to sort of like take care of them and at the same time enjoy the beauty of the environment, which is another foundational principle of the Montessori method. The classroom, classrooms were beautiful and Montessori wanted them to be beautiful because beauty was a central component of the appreciation of the environment. According to Montessori, beauty will stimulate kindness. So if you have the chance to visit um, a couple of beautiful museums in Italy, uh, one is in Palidano di, di Gonzaga, it's called Gonzaga Ready Museum, and it's uh, one of the first producers of Montessori materials. But you also have the Casa Natale Maria Montessori in Chiaravalle, which is another beautiful museum that uh, displays uh, several of the first furniture that Montessori designed and created, and that she was one of the first people to design child-sized furniture. And for Montessori, one of the critical points is that they have to be beautiful so that the child will appreciate the environment and develop this harmony with peers and with the environment. Now, with the children of the earthquake, what happens is that she realizes that there, there's something off with a couple of them. And Montessori would write about that in 1950, in the 1950s. 
she talks specifically about one of them, Bruno. Bruno Montessori is obsessed with this Bruno. I know it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's funny right now. And uh, and little Bruno actually, uh, little Bruno was suffering from what you would say now post traumatic stress disorder. He wouldn't move. He wouldn't talk. And so Montessori later would would start thinking about how uh, practical life activities help this young boy to sort of recuperate what she she calls him. She calls it his mental faculty. Uh, the, through two key components of the Montessori method, she will argue he will sort of return back to life. <coughs> the idea is that it's that the repetition of the activities will be soothing to those who experience trauma, as well as the fact that activities were progressive, so from easiest to hardest. Uh, the Montessori method is based on the stimulation of the senses. So many of these children had experienced a sensorial deprivation in that they lived in, envir in poor environments. Montessori, as Silvia mentioned, was the Montessori method was born in, a peri in the periphery of Rome, in the San Lorenzo district, in the neighborhood of San Lorenzo, which at the time was at the periphery of the city of Rome. In a neighborhood, Montessori would say that only the deaf would go because it was close to a cemetery, so nobody would dare to go in San Lorenzo. So sort of like this, the focus on children who were deprived of stimuli is the, it's the very foundation of the approach, and it's what continues to keep Montessori engaged in research. Now, the humanitarian intervention is born out of those reflections, and my argument is that, I mean, it's a continuum, it's a, it's a filo rosso, a red thread that, you know, sort of runs through her life. Uh, she, in addition to being a person who's deeply engaged in humanitarian action, Montessori was also uh, Montessori was also a person who had a sort of a not an easy personality to deal with, and mm -hmm. so you know she sort of like stops working with the nuns, uh, fights with the uh, person who put her in charge of her first children's mm -hmm. house, and sort of like starts traveling. Right, this is a another like important threat of Montessori's life is that she does not get along with the people she works if they sort of like you know, try to be slightly independent, which is extremely ironic for somebody who talks about the freedom of the child in the classroom, you know, one of the discrepancies. But what she does is that as she starts traveling and training more people internationally, I mean, the training centers are always in Italy at, at this moment, but a lot of foreigners start, you know, recognizing the importance of the Montessori method and travel to Italy and uh, to Rome. To Rome. To Rome. Uh, yes, specifically to Rome they travel. And uh, what happens is that there's a, um, a very wealthy New Yorker. Uh, her name is Mary Rebecca Cromwell. She had traveled to Paris at the beginning. She traveled to Paris in 1902 and uh, decided to study the Montessori method, so she went to Rome. Um, and she just uh, became a Montessori teacher. Now, World War I starts, and uh, she decides, Mary Rebecca Cromwell decides that she wants to take on 200 children refugees from, Fran from Northern <coughs> France and Belgium who had experienced the traumas of the so-called rape of Belgium and sort of like have them be in a Montessori classroom. She thought that, uh, again, the, you know, probably intuitively thinking about the same, you know, sort of parameters that Montessori had seen with the orphans before, she thought that the stimulation of the senses, the repetition of the activities could have a soothing effect on these children. And so what happens is that Mary Rebecca Cromwell opens up three Montessori schools. She uh, looks for Montessori materials. Again, this is in, in the midst of the war. So Montessori ships uh, uh, sets of materials for three schools and she hosts this initiative. Um, now Montessori, of course, has to see this. So she traveled from Barcelona, where she just moved. Montessori had moved to Barcelona in 1915, and visits the school and starts investigating what the effects of war on, chi on the children's psyche are. Again, 1916, the various organizations that are looking into sort of like protecting civilians are not thinking about the psychological support for civilians. They're thinking specifically about material support, right? Uh, we looked before at the timeline in the Montessori organization website. You have 1914, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child. That is written by Eglantine Jeb, who's the founder of the Save the Children Fund, right? Save the Children, everybody knows it. It's still like a very vibrant organization. So Eglantine Jeb funds the Save the Children Fund parallelly to Montessori, uh, to the work, of Montes the work by Montessori on the uh, refugee children. But what she's concerned with is surely the material support. Eglantine Jab will send like food and, you know, sort of clothing to the children. 
What Montessori wants to do instead is to create an organization that would spread systematically her approach to every war zone in Europe. Again, 1916, uh, so mainly would be Western, Eastern, and Eastern Europe. And what she wants is that she wants to create an organization that she wants to call the White Cross. The White Cross would be opposed to the Red Cross, so you would have the blood of the combatants being dealt by the Red Cross, the symbol of the Red Cross symbolizes the blood, but Montessori was interested in the gray matter, in the psychological wounds that the war caused. And so what she wants to create is this organization called the White Cross. Uh, ambitious, uh, uh, she seeks for money everywhere. Uh, she writes to, Sig to Sigmund Freud, who says, great initiative, can't pay for it. Uh, she writes to uh, the Pope, Benedict XV, which is a fairly natural, you know, sort of like outcome to be looking for the Pope, because the Pope had, ju had just written the, uh, the peace note in 1917, asking for the end, the, like an uh, end of the war without winners, and, uh, uh, and to several other people she was collaborating with. Uh, she's in the United States, actually, in 1917, so she would write to the mayor of Chicago uh, and to various other notables in the United States. Um, she never gets the funds. Yeah, it's, uh, it's beautiful to see as a historian, if you go to the um, Apostolic Archive, there are letter, there's a letter that she writes to the Pope, and it's a, you know, it's a very heartfelt letter. Like this is, she was really trying to be compelling and sort of a appeal to sort of a, you know, Pope Benedict XV's uh, heart, and talking about the plight of these children and what they were experiencing. And so you have the letter, and on top, like a hand, handwritten note saying, uh, you know, thank Montessori for this initiative, sounds great. You know, of course, it's not Pope Benedict XV writing it, but probably somebody mm -hmm. close to the Pope. And, you know, it's written with one pen, and underneath it's, uh, but, but, you know, the papacy doesn't sponsor initiatives that are not already up and running. This is a, you know, it's just the norm within the Vatican not to support initiatives that are not already established especially initiatives that have nothing to do with religion, like yeah. in this case. Uh, Montessori, of course, when she writes to the Pope, doesn't stress the fact that this would cure the psychological wounds of the child. She focuses more on the sort of like religious and morality mm. and, you know, that kind of uh, uh, rehabilitation. And underneath there's another like handwritten note that says Montessori did not take it too well. Oh. And that, you know, it really speaks to the character and the personality that Montessori had. If we can show some photos, I can just you will. Yeah, yeah. If we can show some photos, here you have, uh, um, oh, this is another photo, practical life activities. Uh, those are the French and Belgian refugee children in one of the schools. Um, this is the entrance of the school, uh, just uh, lunch outside probably, uh, outdoor eating with the children. This is the nursery. Maria Montessori's project was, uh, um, was a very ambitious one. I mean, again, I was speaking about psychological wounds, but here what you have is that she wanted to employ the widows of the battles of Verdun and Champagne and La Somme. So her project was very much of a 360 degree project that would involve everybody, every civilian who had been affected by the war. So the widowers who could emotionally connect with the children were supposed to be trained as Montessori teacher and be employed in the classrooms. But uh, here is a dormitory for the children. And you also had a, um, this is a workshop for Montessori materials where Montessori uh, and Mary Rebecca Cromwell hired the mutilated soldiers of the war to be sort of rehabilitated and uh, allowed to work once again. And to show you really the synergies that Montessori was envisioning in such environment, here you have a brochure to get funds to, to sort of like create the White Cross where you will see young children, the refugee themselves, visiting uh, the workshop and learning about, uh, you know, the construction of Montessori. And going back to the previous photo, if you have been inside one Montessori classroom, you have probably seen that little box. It's the uh, box where teachers keep the, uh, it's, um, Montessori teaches math through a series of like little pearls that are hanged together by like a string. So it's, it's very much something that you would see in any Montessori school right now. And this is again in France in 1916. As you can see, there's a, a blind soldier there working on Montessori materials. Uh, you probably can see, but he has uh, tiny glasses, I think. Uh, children visiting the workshop, and you would also have uh, a photo in the brochure where you have instead uh, the uh, soldiers visiting instead uh, the Montessori classroom to sort of like see 
how the materials that were created was utilized within the Montessori classroom. was never created. Uh, Montessori was very disappointed, as the Pope pointed out. Uh, but um, she will rework, she will work again in similar on similar initiatives later. There's a letter uh, inside the folder of the uh, Polizia Politica at the uh, Central Archive in Rome. The, in 1936, Montessori was followed by the fascist police. And yeah. in one of the papers, it says that um, Montessori wanted to create the very same organization, but for the children affected by the Spanish Civil War. So this is a project she will return to, and sort of uh, it would be something that she would attempt to create throughout her life, with, with unfortunately without success. Well, without a little bit of success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you mentioned fascism, and that's where we go through, no? After right. World War One, that's what what is we're gonna deal with. What is her relationship with fascism, with Mussolini, and with yeah. this is something still very difficult to talk about with Italians who lived Absolutely. during that time, right? Absolutely. And the problem is that many, many of the sources on the life of Maria Montessori are in the family archive in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the family archive and you say, I want to be working on Montessori and fascism, they're not going to be that happy. But I mean, it's the, you know, most of the time in many works on Maria Montessori is the elephant in the room. Uh, many historians would say that she was not political, uh, that Montessori was not interested in politics, she was only in interested in the child. I mean, one of the chapters of my book is on Montessori in the United States in 1916 and 17. She, um, she's in the United States and it's the first time that she overtly speaks about education and pacifism. And she has a, like an incredibly savvy analysis of the uh, of President Woodrow Wilson attempt to enter World War One. Mm -hmm. That is something that after 18 years in the U.S., I wouldn't be able to do with such subtlety and sort of like uh, political savviness, I would say. So I didn't believe that theory. And uh, I mean, I wrote a book on Montessori and pacifism. I don't think Montessori is a fascist, nor I think that Montessori was a sympathizer. You have a woman who struggled to obtain financial security throughout her life. And on the other hand, you have a dictator who was interested in uh, being recognized at the international level. So Mussolini uh, would invite Maria Montessori to come back to Italy, promising her what she had sought throughout her entire life, which is to gain uh, national recognition in Italy. So Montessori came back to Italy. Uh, she truly wanted to go back to Italy throughout her entire life. There's a letter from India in in the at the end of the 1940s that it's moving for how excited she is to be invited once again in post-World War II to Italy. And, uh, you know, she, I think she thought she could carve a niche for herself. And she did so for, uh, you know, almost eight, nine years. And uh, when... Um, uh, when she was imposed the classes on fascist education to Montessori teachers, mm -hmm. she just uh, decided that it wasn't worth it and left. And this is 1932, though sort of like the, the first inkling of Montessori's desire to leave Italy already in 1926, 19... And this is a woman who traveled extensively. So I will say that the, from 1922 to 1926, she was in Italy and sort of attempted to sort of put roots back again in Italy. But then, uh, I mean, she would travel to the to uh, the UK extensively to give training courses. She would give lectures here and there. So it's a, sort of a, I think that she realizes fairly soon that there's no space for her and, you know, sort of like tries to keep it going because there's a um, Scuola Regia per il Metodo is established. So she has a, a huge training uh, center for herself, mm -hmm. but then leaves. So, but, but I, do, though, I do think that Montessori was definitely smart enough to understand what was, was, was happening. And then I think it's a lack on the side of those who have studied her life to say that she just didn't care. I mean, this is a person who's deeply engaged in, uh, in research on pacifism. How could she not care? Well, right? Yeah, she probably was one of the first to realize what was happening. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And again, I mean, when you write a biography, you really, I mean, I spent 12 years with this woman. <laughs> and... Uh, it's a it's it's really hard not to see sort of the human aspect and sympathize with that. It's a it, I spent too much not to understand sort of what com what complex person she was, mm -hmm. and not to sort of like empathize with the desire to go back to Italy uh, 
at a sort of a gut level. I don't know if I... <laughs> no, no, definitely. And, and I'm actually also thinking about, we talked a lot about kids, about children, and how, and how she's actually interested in uh, recuperating these children. But there is also, she, she's also doing that for their mothers, right? right. Because right, right. she needs to give the mothers the possibility of going to work. Right. Want to talk a little bit about this? Absolutely. Uh, the first children's house uh, is actually, uh, Montessori is called to open a sort of a daycare for children because the children were left unattended by their mothers. The person in charge of the Istituto Romano dei Beni Stabili, which is the Roman organization that sort of revamped this neighborhood, was interested in sort of keeping the walls white and clean. And when children were left unattended, they would just scribble anywhere. So uh, their mothers went to work, and Montessori was supposed to be in charge of these children. And uh, so she, Montessori was put in charge of them. And Montessori is deeply invested in the feminist movement for, mm -hmm. I would say, 15 years. And uh, it's funny how like academics think about faces. And uh, I mean, as if afterwards, she just stopped caring about women. I, my, one of the idea behind the book is that she did not. It just she, you know, as the White Cross project shows, she continued to think about what are we doing for the rest of the family, right? Like, how can we employ these women who suffer from the war? Um, but uh, she was more engaged with feminist organization from 1896 to 1908. Uh, Montessori was, uh, uh, her feminism was rooted in biologism. So she was not like truly avant-garde mm. in that she believed that women uh, were different from men and that that difference was supposed to be sort of like their, their strength to be participated into society. So Montessori thought that women should be social mothers, even though even those who did not have children should act as mother and bring their feminine virtue into the public sphere. Uh, many of the things that Montessori argued for, 1896, if you go back to the, we don't need to go back, but 1896, she attends a, a women's congress in London, and she speaks about equal pay for women, so she's very much at the forefront for certain issues, uh, and she also advocated for the presence of women in the public sphere to be talking about science, as she was a scientist herself, she thought that women would be the instrument, the carrier of, uh, you know, the main principles of science. But that was rooted on women being mothers, right? Mm -hmm. So Montessori, uh, I mean, the, her vision of, of womanhood had to do, I mean, pass through the child always. And, uh, and, I, con and I argue that she continued to be a, a feminist throughout her life through that specific angle, I think. Right. Well, it's, I, I take it. It's good enough. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Equal pay in 1896, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Let's talk, so you mentioned that she traveled a lot, she's been all over the world, and in fact she's known all over the world, and everybody or every nation claims a little piece of Maria Montessori. Oh, Absolutely. she was here, a little bit like Garibaldi slept Absolutely. here, or Garibaldi ate here, right? But she's from Chiaravalle, Absolutely. and we're here talking about a little bit of Marche. So why don't you tell us a little bit of what is her connection with her birthplace and with yeah. the Marche region? Well, Montessori was born in Chiaravalle. Uh, if you're interested in Montessori tourism, as I mentioned before, there's this beautiful museum that just opened up uh, um, a year and a half ago. Uh, there was a beautiful exhibit in Ancona, I think groundbreaking. It was called uh, Toccare la Bellezza, uh, from Montessori to Munari, Touching Beauty from Montessori to Munari. It was based on uh, um, tactilism, <coughs> and it was held at Mole, al Museo Mole, Le Mole. Le Mole. Mm -hmm. Museo Romero, see, uh, and it was beautiful. It was actually now the the, the exhibit just closed, uh, but it was also in Rome, uh, and I do think that there's space for uh, such exhibit. I think in the United States, it's an incredible exhibit, and it's really groundbreaking in that there's a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, tactile. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a very interactive exhibit. So I think that there could be place to to this for this exhibit to travel uh, outside of Italy. Uh, the relationship is. Uh, uh, is, is strong uh, in that Montessori lived in Chiaravalle for five years. Um, the uh, Stoppani family, there's a little bit of a, a sort of a, uh, there's a little bit of research going on and trying to establish whether Antonio Stoppani, who was a famous geologist, was actually Maria Montessori's uncle or not. Uh, he was a bishop and I worked extensively at the Vatican Archive and I could not find anything, but. I mean, until now, they say that the Stoppani family, based in Le Marche, was uh, uh, related to Maria Montessori. 
The reason why it's interesting that Antonio Stoppani was related to Montessori is that he was a geologist, but he was also uh, the writer of Il Bel Paese, who was a very famous uh, uh, book for elementary school that was meant to show the beauties of Italy to the children at the elementary school level. So there's that connection of Montessori being a scientist, a uh, psychiatrist, and interested in education that sort of mirrors this double interest that Montessori has in uh, uh, pedagogy, but at the same time coming from a medical background. Now, uh, the reason why I'm questioning that is that it's just there's no historical proof of that, but many historians have claimed that, that's the, that Antonio Stoppani was the uncle of Maria Montessori's mother, Renilde Stoppani. Uh, Montessori uh, aunt uh, was supposed to be working at the Manifattura tabac uh, Tabacchi in uh, Chiaravalle, and the numerous strikes uh, that occurred uh, prior to the birth of Maria Montessori have supposedly influenced uh, Maria Montessori's mother, and sort of that feisty and sort of engaged social activist nature that Maria Montessori had, as well as her engagement with the feminist movement, which was barely tolerated by Maria Montessori's mother, seemed to be something that she sort of uh, uh, had because of her family history. The other important connection has to do again with feminism in that in, 1890, in uh, 1906, Montessori signed a proclamation, proclama, right? I don't know mm -hmm. if it was, yeah. Uh, because technically women were not, uh, the Constitution didn't met not the Constitution, what am I saying? Uh, at a legislative level, nothing prevented women from voting, right? So Montessori writes this proclama together with other women, uh, and uh, the proclama calls for every woman in Italy to nominate themselves for local elections. And that spurs a controversy in the country, and many women actually nominate themselves for local elections. Montessori uh, supports a group of women uh, from uh, uh, their mainly teacher, their 10 teacher, uh, who, teachers who, lived, uh, uh, who work right outside Ancona, um, to be nominated for uh, local elections. Uh, the Corte di Cassazione um, sort of like stops these attempts throughout Italy, except for in Le Marche, uh, except for in Ancona. So they go on into the next tier or the next judicial level, and only then they're squashed. So Montessori for a few months has the hope that her native land could be sort of like the, the, the birthplace of an uproar for women's emancipation, which of course we know it's not going to occur until... Uh, uh, a few, a few decades, a few decades <laughs> later. But, uh, and again, uh, uh, this group of women is uh, um, supported by and encouraged by Maria Montessori. Montessori also goes back to Le Marche uh, after World War II. Uh, there's uh, some beautiful pictures that I was able to see when I visited the, the museum uh, uh, that are would be key to be thinking about Montessori and post-World War II reconstruction. It's that she is... Uh, uh, She's uh, like wa walking into a city that it's clearly gone through, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the hardship of the war. So those uh, would be beautiful photos to be able to sort of like spread, and in, especially in light of Montessori's engagement with, uh, with uh, civilians impacted by the war. Amazing. Um, let me ask a last question, and then we'll open the floor to the public. Um, so that's her local connection with Le Marche. What yeah. about international connections? And here I'm thinking what we said at the beginning. New York and the U.S. Right. is the place where the most Montessori schools right. are concentrated. But they don't look anything of right. what you said. Yeah, no, right? no. It's definitely not a place for refugees, no, but unfortunately. more for... Uh, yeah. children who have a very wealthy family behind. Yeah. So what can you tell us about it? I'll show you, I'll show you a map. Let me, um, so there's a, uh, there's a beautiful tool. It's called, uh, uh, this is the proclamation. Donne sor tutte sorgete, il vostro primo dovere in questo momento sociale è di chiedere il voto politico. So this comes out in a, in a newspaper uh, titled La Vita and it sort of spurs controversy throughout Italy. And in March, it's when uh, uh, women uh, um, throughout Italy start nominating themselves. But here you have, uh, um, so if you're interested in seeing the diffusion of Montessori in the United States, uh, uh, there's a beautiful tool, it's called the Montessori Census, and it's sponsored by an organization called the Montessori in the Public Sector. Uh, there are 4,000 Montessori schools in the U.S., private, and almost 500 Montessori schools um, in, uh, in the U.S., public, excuse me. Uh, this is a map of private Montessori schools in Manhattan, and the center of the map is the Istituto. 
And this is a map of public school, public Montessori schools in Manhattan. There are only two. One of them is Montessori inspired. It is not officially Montessori. So now the main idea behind Montessori, it's not, it's not a patented name. So anybody could open a school and call it Montessori and have nothing of Montessori. If you have young kids and you've done uh, school tours, everybody's going to mention Montessori. Everybody's going to mention Reggio. If you push back, they're going to say that it's, it's child center, which is ridiculous because anything is child. Nobody, nobody would say that they're not child center. Like, what are you centering on if you're not in 2022? Right? So, um, so what you have here, it's a, a, a big discrepancy between Montessori's original message and the way she kept on working throughout her life. And uh, so my idea is to, uh, but there are also incredible projects throughout the world. If you're interested in Montessori in disadvantaged areas, the, Educa the uh, Association Educateurs Sans Frontiers promotes, for example, uh, the training of women in uh, prisons in England. Uh, they are trained in the Montessori method and they're allocated uh, to specific classrooms where they can teach their own children the Montessori method. Um, Montessori for uh, a nomad tribe in Kenya is also sponsored by these organizations. So they're incredible initiatives. But what we see is the reality of a uh, $52,000 uh, uh, daycare uh, that, you know, of course, going to be the, if you're lucky, <laughs> if you get in. So, I mean, aside for, you know, sort of going back to the original message and rethinking about Montessori from the perspective uh, that I just showed you, uh, I think that it's imperative that we, we really look at different initiatives instead of the one that's around us, right? <laughs> Definitely. So that's a little bit provocatory, I would say. And I. <laughs> um, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely. Which is what is supposed to be. And it's yeah. definitely important that we look at things uh, from this perspective. Um, any question, guys? Please. What? Why did you decide to write a book about this uh, Montessori? Um, there's an incredible book. Uh, it's called uh, Il Feminismo Scientifico di Maria Montessori that came out in the early 2000s. I really liked it. And I thought that there was so much more to this woman than the Mille Lire. Uh, the, the cover of my book, it's directly in opposition to that. You always have this uh, Donna Serafica, like staring at the child, kind of in a, in a trance and not really... And it, she's usually painted up as an painted as an elderly woman, and I thought that that image was so flat and boring that you know what I read in this book was the exact opposite. So I kept on finding little clues here and there, and you know I was fascinated by the fact that she was so stubborn and sort of not getting along with a lot of people, and I thought that it could be an interesting book. It took me a while to find my angle, the pacifist angle, but uh, I've had fun. I've had fun. Thank you. <laughs> to look for the picture. By the way, uh, the Bel Paese by Stoppani inspired the cheese. It's the true, Paese. it's true, the little, the little cheese <laughs> exactly. by him, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, it's interesting because uh, if we think about the pedagogy, the most uh, known pedagogy of the end of 19th century, uh, it's uh, written uh, by males, uh, much more than uh, females. Uh, and uh, I think about uh, two very famous books at the time, one Quore by the Amicis, uh, uh, and the other one, uh, which was uh, the answer to Quore, Testa, the mind, uh, by Mantegazza. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's uh, the positivism. Uh, and uh, uh, so from one point of view, there was uh, a very sentimental uh, approach education. On the other hand, uh, you have a very rationalistic, uh, positivistic uh, uh, approach. What about uh, the empathy, this uh, di dimension uh, which is crucial uh, in uh, uh, children? Uh, what's uh, the relation uh, between Montessori and uh, this uh, horizon? Uh, Montessori was a disciple of uh, Giuseppe Sergi. She studied with him at La Sapienza when she got a degree in anthropology. Um, it's a uh, the, the first Montessori writings are, are incredible. She is uh, actually, 
to, uh, per prendere l'abilitazione, so to be able to, be te to teach anthropology, Montessori has to write an, an article. And so what she is asked to do is to go into the Lazio region and measure uh, women's uh, you know, bodily measurement and uh, work on their like, sort of, uh, you know, cognitive development. So it's a purely positivistic work that Giuseppe Sergi gives, her, gives to her. But in the following year, she starts writing, uh, um, I forget that, it's, a, it's a, a couple of writings that directly address Lombroso and Giuseppe Sergi, and she says that in children's achievements, what counts is, of course, the measurement, the physical measurements. So she borrows from Sergi la carta biografica, which is sort of a, a set of measurements that schools were, that Sergi was arguing were necessary to study sort of this, the psychological uh, uh, and physical growth of a child. But Montessori argues that the social, economic, and affective condition of a child are also crucial to the child's development. So she inserts an entire new landscape to, you know, to, to, to the assessment that Sergi was giving to a child. And so the, I mean, what I do with my book is, is to see that evolution, is to trace a sort of like the departure that Montessori has from the positivist school to arrive to like sort of a, a better rounded vision of the child. Uh, when it comes to the sort of nostalgic and uh, more, you know, affective dimension that uh, the Amici touches, Montessori is not interested. The teacher is a scientist, uh, um, you know, yeah, the teacher is a scientist. Montessori is in direct opposition with another uh, very important pedagogical approach, which is that by the Agazzi sister that gets selected by the Italian government to be the one utilized in the Italian school system in 1914. And that's why Montessori leaves Italy. She does not accept that the Agazzi are selected and she just moves to Barcelona. Um, at the time, Giuseppe Sergi writes an article and says, it's normal that Montessori is not the method sele selected for the Italian school system because the Montessori teacher is a scientist while the Agazzi teacher is a mother. The Montessori teacher doesn't seek affectionate connection with the child. Like it, she is an observer. Montessori says that the teacher has to be a scientist and that she has to observe from a distance what happens between the child and the material. So empathy is there in the sense that the, the teacher has to respect this miracle that occurs, which is, which is the child's grow, growth, but she can't interfere. Otherwise she would sort of like prevent the process from occurring. So it's, it's really losing the centrality of the teacher very, Montessori loses the centrality of the teacher very early on. And what Sergi also writes, this is in La Cultura Popolare, is that Montessori is really better suited for the United States, which is a place where the child, you know, uh, is uh, uh, asked to perform social mobility, uh, to, you know, become who or she, he or she wants. And so, you know, that hence the you know, incredible success that Montessori had achieved in 1913 when she came to the US. So he was kind of like sort of in, like pushing her to move to the United States and sort of like you, he would say like you will be, you will reach a lot of success there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, grazie. Thanks again for the presentation. I didn't know a lot of these things about Maria Montessori. So you mentioned that she started her method also to cure what then became known as post-traumatic stress disorder. So I was wondering if uh, people have ever measured or uh, like assessed how effective her method is to cure P PTSD. Anytime that I, that I present my work, there's somebody who wants to start the white cross and wants to start working on this. And there are a few people who are running master thesis who are directly working on this issue, but there's nobody who has done work on this. Like there's nobody who has uh, evaluated whether the Montessori method is better or not uh, than, you know, other methodology to help children overcome trauma. But I'm confident there's gonna be somebody because there's so much interest and- uh, We have a neuroscientist here. That, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm, I didn't say anything before. I didn't wanna spoil the presentation, but I was excited to have her. Uh, the other thing is that um, one of the, you know, the, the, the photos that I showed you before, um, I found some memories of the children who um, had been rescued or been uh, hosted by uh, Mary Rebecca Cromwell in her schools in Paris. And some of these refugees addressed directly the lack of uh, stimuli that they had while they were hiding in uh, basements and, you know, sort of uh, uh, sort of lack of light, lack of like anything that could sort of like trigger trigger them positively uh, and, a cogni uh, co and cognitively. So 
uh, Montessori responds directly to that. And since the stimulation of the senses is at the center of our approach, I would say that it could potentially. But yes, <laughs> if uh, the neuroscientists in the audience could help us out, I would love to hear more. Yeah, <clears throat> first of all, thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. I'm very happy that I, I'm here tonight. Um, I have so many things to say, I don't know where from, to start from. So first of all, I, I align very much with the Montessori, what she said. Uh, I'm curious, the, my question is, uh, how is this method used in Italy? How many school, Montessori schools do we have in Italy? How is your book received in Italy? Um, <laughs> did you present your book, what's going on in Italy with this? Because this is so important. So, and then I'm just going to mention this and we can talk extensively. Absolutely. But my work, so I work on the biology of learning and memory. And my work more recently is focusing on the biology of learning and memory during development, where there is very little known. And everything we find is so aligned with what she did right. that I think we have the biology of what she did. Absolutely. Uh, and then in a nutshell is the development of the brain and brain functions in, term, in terms of learning and memory and cognitive functions are the results of experience. Right. There is no program because that's what the brain does, is processing information. Uh, so I can go on and on, but let's go back to the questions. Montessori has some beautiful pages on generational traumas uh, that align with uh, Condillac, I think is her, his name, uh, so with a French psychiatrist. And the idea, Montessori really writes about France as being in, on the verge of a catastrophe. And she says, like, if we don't cure these children, the next generation is going to be so, like she calls them adult with an, an unsound psyche, that they're going to reverberate the trauma onto the successive generation. She will say like, friends, friends is done if we don't do something. Like that's the main message that she gives in uh, 1917. And uh, I mean, uh, this is a uh, general knowledge. Uh, the reason why I've written a little bit on popular press, it's because uh, in 1917, there was a new study that was sponsored by Save the Children that was analyzing the, um, uh, the impact of, uh, uh, of toxic stress on children's mind and re the repeated experience of stress. And so the words that I was reading in this article that had to do with Syrian children on the seventh anniversary of the Syrian war were exactly the same words that I was reading from 100 years before from Montessori. So the urgency remains the same. Uh, Montessori's sort of like lack of tools to assess the actual trauma is, you know, sort of uncanny. It makes you think about sort of like the impact of this multifaceted background in her pedagogy, right? She was a psychiatrist. She also got a degree in anthropology. She started studying psychology. Uh, and sorry, not psychology. She started studying uh, um, philosophy. Uh, so if you actually read her books, it's... Uh, it's incredible the knowledge that this woman had. It's truly like references to the Holy Scripture, to Nietzsche. It's uh, it's it's very you know moving, um, and 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 yes, I would love to be thinking yeah. a little bit more so, about. So what about Italy? Oh, but about Italy, scusa, scusa. Scusa. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there are 243 schools in Italy. They're mostly scuole paritarie, so private schools that get public fundings. Uh, they're mainly around Rome. Uh, Perugia has recently started a Distretto Montessori. Uh, they're incredible schools and incredible realities, very much, you know, for sort of uh, downtown Perugia, downtown Rome, so catering to a certain sort of affluent population. It's repeated. And then, of course, there are incredible schools, like uh, una scuola pubblica, a public school in uh, Sardinia that just opened up, Centro Nascita Montessori. So both in the U.S. and in Italy, there are incredible places that do incredible work, but they're not the sort of like the ordinary schools. And so, what, for example, the Distretto Montessori, it's a new sort of a, uh, um, association created in Perugia, what, is, what they're trying to do is to help them spread the methodology in the periphery of the city of Perugia instead of only downtown with private school at 350, 400 euros a month, which of course very few people can afford, right? And uh, there's a couple of good organizations in Italy uh, that promote the Montessori method. It's a uh, 
They recently actually received a PRIN, a Progetto di Rilevanza Nazionale, so there's been a little bit more studies, an attempt to create a mapping of Montessori schools in Italy as well. But I do get email from people who are interested in, for example, um, uh, opening up the very same project I was speaking about in England. So uh, Madri Carcerate, uh, Incarcerated Women and Their Children, uh, Rebibbia, but I'm a historian, <laughs> I can't do any of that. But the interest is there. I think that what people need is sort of like to funnel that interest into something more concrete. Yes, but it seems like, you know, since Montessori, nothing much has happened. And I'm, I'm surprised that this well, didn't get more successfully developed. I mean, I think Italy could be promoting so much more right. in more effective education, and especially now that we can provide some data link to that and engage also research of psychologists right, or cognitive right. scientists that do the work on children in addition to the biology of the brain that we do uh, what we see is that the development is depends on the experience that the children have during critical periods right certain right. ages is exactly what she has used in her method so if a critical period is not met in the best way, the subsequent critical period is going to be impacted. Right. Everything is going to be impacted right. in life. We see that learning in early development influences adult behavior. Absolutely. We have the proof now. Right. So, but she was she used oh, no, no, that. Yeah, she from called the it mente assorbente. It's a, it's a, you know it's it's truly fascinating the way she understood uh, and she actually worked even on prenatal. Uh, you know, sort of like the, the health of the child from a prenatal stage. I give an example uh, to see how like things are not working in the Montessori world. Uh, Jeff Bezos is a Montessori child. He uh, is very proud to be a Montessori child together with some other like tech tycoons in the United States. Um, they, uh, Bezos, uh, a few years ago, donated $2 billion to sort of revitalize a couple of school districts, uh, one in New Jersey specifically, and uh, I forget what the other one was, but he donated a tremendous amount of money specifically to Montessori education. He wanted to revamp a couple of Montessori schools and to create a stronger Montessori networks of school. But instead of donating them to the existing organizations, which are, you know, Florida up and running, already know sort of like the, the law of the land when it comes to early childhood education in these areas, he just, you know, recreated another organization that would sort of allocate the funds, wasting in this middle management, you know, in this middle sort of transition, wasting a lot of the $2 billion. The other thing is that if you look at the initiative from Jeff Bezos' website, you will see that he describes the child as a consumer. And when I read it, I had a heart attack. So, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, meaning well, but uh, the, the actual objective is completely missed there. And so there, there's a lot of like replication of the structure without that doesn't, that ends up not having an impact on the recipient, which is the child, of course, and in this case, a child in an underdeserved area. So I guess maybe getting rid of some of the structure would <laughs> And what about your book on Italy? Uh, I'm working hard on the translation. Uh, the problem is that the, people want to like a book that tells you why Montessori abandoned her child. And my book doesn't tell you that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very sorry, just that I, I don't care about that. And, you know, if you care about that, you should read other books that are incredible books that have been written, but that it's not what I do research on. So it's extremely easy to find a publisher. If you're looking into Maria Montessori's relationship with Giuseppe Montesano, their, chi their, chi their child, why they abandoned him. But uh, very little. I mean, there's, little, there's less interest in a book that has to do with a specific, you know, aspects of her work. So I'm hoping to find a publisher. <laughs> I remember a very beautiful article by a great writer, uh, Antonio Fogazzaro, about the opening uh, of uh, an asilo Montessori in Vicenza. And it was at the end of an 18th century beginning of 20th century. So uh, there were very initiatives, uh, many initiatives at the time. Then uh, I had uh, 
Uh, and her mother who was a teacher in the same years, uh, her mother who was a teacher, an uncle who was a teacher. <laughs> and I, go, uh, I grew up uh, hearing uh, the name Montessori. Uh, I think that Montessori is always uh, is uh, also beyond uh, the limit of the Montessori schools. She influenced uh, a lot uh, the the way uh, people uh, were teaching uh, and uh, were inventing. There is a sort a sort of hybrid system in Italy that uh, was able to absorb some elements uh, in, uh, of Montessori. Uh, and uh, so if we have uh, to make a real uh, um, history of a pedagogy in 20th century, we should l look not for purity, Absolutely. but uh, for this uh, mixture of uh, methods. Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, uh, th there's a lot of uh, uh, desire to talk about Montessori as if she was an asylum. Montessori is accused of plagiarism in the United States. Uh, book by William Kilpatrick, a follower of uh, John Dewey, uh, accuses Montessori of like cherry picking like concepts here and there from different pedagogues. So I think that Montessori and Montessori's organizations have worked hard to prove that Montessori had very original ideas, kind of like forgetting the fact that she was building on, you know, sort of like uh, many scholars. Uh, Felicita Buchner, uh, who was the lover of Fugazzaro, yes. lover, right? Uh, she is, uh, she deeply influences Montessori and she is uh, at La Montesca, which is a, a villa outside of Città di Castello when Montessori writes her approach. So it's, uh, you know, right in the history of Montessori, you'll see it in the book, it's really thinking about turn of the century Rome. It's, in, it's thinking about the diffusion of pedagogy, but also theosophy, Catholicism, education to beauty, it's a uh, skeet for her. So there's a couple of really important Roman artists that Montessori interacts and borrows extensively. So I think that we're now at a phase in which we can say that she borrowed from other people without a fear of saying she plagiarized or she, you know, she took from. It's a, it, it must be conceived as a hybrid methodology that is born in a, in a sort of a, a moment of cross-pollination and, and sort of influences from all over the world. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you. Um, I guess we can, if you don't have any other specific question, we can definitely close it here. Thank you so much again, Erica, thank you, and thank you, yeah. everybody. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, yeah, we have, why don't you announce our... Okay, we have um, our rinfresco from Marche, again, from Cremini, uh, with this uh, restaurant in Brooklyn, and uh, the specific uh, Marchigiane recipes uh, with Cremini, cream, and olives. So uh, we can continue the conversation tasting Marche. Also. Incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, again. Thanks.